It is mid July 2023, and you are listening to the <coughs> photography. The future of photography. Just the two of us. How are you doing, Jeremiah? I'm doing well. Back, back in LA, and uh, proof. I managed to get through my shoot and now into post and. Uh, how does okay so 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 you how does this work you you you're bright you scout locations everything gets set up then then you shoot how long does that does a shoot for a season take is that a month uh, is that well uh, it depends how many uh you have ordered but uh like for us we you know we get an order from the network um then what we do is we um we get the writer's room together with my partner, Harley Payton, and um, he runs the room. And uh, they basically beat out the, the next season. And by beat out, I mean they just go through incrementally what the shape of the season is emotionally, mm -hmm. story-wise, character-wise, make all the arcs. It's a, you know, just create that particular um, structure. Okay. Then, uh, then the writing is assigned. The writers write, and that takes maybe until we get enough scripts to start the budgeting process, and we start to b build the office out in terms of our line producers and budgeting and <laughs> locations and accumulate people. That takes a few months. A lot of this can be done remotely, so you know. And since we're this is the second season, we know. What we're doing, we know. You where already we're kind of have a have a, yeah. a groove going with from everything. last year, yeah. so so that's good, and we know what budget we're writing to, and we know what our characters are. We start to do some casting of new characters that come in. Again, we right. we do initial uh, remotely, uh, and then when I uh, go to location, when I fly out to location, that's when we officially open the process of really. Um, narrowing down the casting, uh, being very specific. This is what I do in terms of um, hiring detect, uh, uh, directors who are going to, you know, do other uh, episodes other than the ones I'm doing. Uh, so I hire three directors. Oh, so um, that's a collaboration between... You think, can, can you see that? If you watch an episode, can you tell? I hope you. The by the way, I hope you can. Uh, I'm, okay. I, there, there's a lot of schools of thought, which is you want it not to be completely seamless. Uh, and I've worked on shows as a guest director where I, I, literally you couldn't tell. Yeah. And but I like to invite directors in who are going to bring their own point of view, their own sense of style, their own sense of grace and delicacy, because our show can can absorb that. Each episode has a slightly different twist, and it could be a I twist. Um, I mean, it's all rooted in our characters, so they don't change their rock solid. But stylistically, you know, some may move the camera a lot, some may not. For example, mm -hmm. I tend to do a lot of camera moves, very, very intricate camera moves. But on the last episode I did, I hardly moved the camera at all. I did it all very hard cuts and very, very... And that's a, that's a creative decision, right? It is, yeah. 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 Okay. As By the way, as well as a budgetary or time decision, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of things that go in. Oh, right, we, yeah. You, if you want to move the camera a lot, you have to have expensive cranes and things, sure. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we then shoot for, I don't know, uh, 70 days in our show. Wow. Around there. That's a lot. And, um, and then uh, we... Meanwhile, I have two editors who are working, you know, so the um, I'll do cuts. We'll review it uh, both as producers and directors. Do you guys still work with cutters, with people whose job it is to edit, or is that all we do. you guys? It's not AI yet. yet. <laughs> no. Uh, no, we, you know, we edit, uh, and we edit um, online. We use something called Evercast, though right. there's uh, several different... Uh, manner so we can work in real time with our editors uh, works very well. We use another system called Pix, where we we can uh, assign uh, the viewing room to very specific people, and it's all very uh, tightly controlled in terms of security. <laughs> no obviously. leaks. No leaks. No leaks. Yeah. 
Uh, and then once we, you know, we are happy with our cut collectively, uh, or the director is happy, then it goes to the producers group, small group, where we all kick in our point of view. Uh, and then we go, uh, then we send it to the network. We tend to get some notes less this year than last, but we get some notes. We adjust those for the broadcast network. Uh, and then we lock it, and then it goes to the composer. We work with the composer on spotting the sound and, and you know, the, isolating any uh, dialogue that needs to be adjusted or uh, re-recorded, um, sound effects, all of that stuff. And then, of course, we go to temp score and then real score. <laughs> then when all so of that is done, we mix and color time. So where, where in that process are you right now? We just uh, just finished uh, mixing episode one, and we just finished shooting episode, basically the last episode. episode. All right, so so everything from now on is post production. Everything from now on is post, and that includes uh, oh. special effects, which are being done by a company called Refinery. They are in uh, Cape Town. Are there any so, reshoots that are necessary? Like if you find out, oops, we missed something very specific, or no, is that is are, that more special effects thing then? It's ma mainly special effects. Reshoots, right. uh, in our case, <laughs> no. We, our budget doesn't allow for reshoots. Once we're done, we're done. So I it's see, really, I uh, see. It's up to the, the directors and <coughs> me, uh, <laughs> as executive producer and director to really make sure that you're prep, that you are shooting what you need, not more, So you not need less. the full coverage, pretty much. Yeah, and the delicacy is we have to cut it to time. Uh, sometimes we're over, sometimes we're under. We have to adjust that. Oh, okay, yeah, there's shooting. a fixed length for each of the episodes. In, yeah. in our case, there is because yeah. it's a cable network. If you're doing streaming, they're much more uh, fluid in terms of time. I see. So it's a process, but uh, now it's the fun part, really. <clears throat> so. All right, so... Um, this is this is funnily enough not the topic you want to talk about, but <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, here's here's the thing. So last last or second last episode, um, we briefly talked about the uh, the Polaroid Artist Support Program, which was a program. Um, when was that? Sometime in the sixties. Well, yeah, I participated in this. 70s. <clears throat> so, so Ainsley Adam was the, the consultant for that, and um, he brought on um, several artists who were supplied by Polaroid with, let's say, a, a bottomless barrel of, of, of cameras and, and uh, material. Fun. And those, those names include, of course, famous names like Andy Warhol or Robert Mapplethorpe or David Hockney, Chuck Close, and so on and so on. The list is long. And uh, you're in very good, <laughs> in very good company there because you were also part of that. Um, can, can, can you just give me, and, and I want to talk about how, what, this, what that does to creativity and so on, but can you just take us there for a second and tell us a bit how did that come along and how did this work, right, just technically? Well, uh, you know, I've been using, obviously, all kinds of <coughs> Polaroids, uh, you know, in, in commercial use. Um, my go-to was uh, Polaroid 195, and mm. uh, that had a very, very good lens, adjustable um, f-stops and speeds, and you could, you know, you could go uh, into a very fine-tuning of the, yeah, one of, this is one of my favorite cameras that I ever used. I still have it, um, though it's pretty beat up. Uh, and it used pull apart, you could use negatives, you could actually use the negatives to make beautiful prints. Um, and then of course, Polaroid backs. So I'd, I'd been using a lot of Polaroids for my work. You know, I'd been working internationally. I don't know how exactly the, um, the particular uh, introduction was, but this at the dawn of the Polaroid SX-70, uh, which was the non-peel apart. So this was anybody who's into Polaroids and had the idea that you could actually use, it was an idea, use a camera that would generate a photograph without any chemicals, washing. Uh, this, was, this was really astonishing uh, for us. And so when the Polaroid SX-70 came out, 
and it was a different camera than the one you saw. They didn't have the uh, focusing, <coughs> uh, I guess it was a radio, I don't know what the hell they used up there, but it was just the, the camera. It was, it, it was ultrasonic. It was an ultrasonic, ultrasonic focusing yeah, sensor, sound, which, yeah, yeah it's crazy, crazy. Uh, all it had is a brightness control. That's pretty much what it had. Um, and so they sent me this camera and just boxes of film. And I think I've mentioned this on the on the show before, but I kind of took it with me to through South America and, um, or uh, Central America, and uh, just uh, you know landed pretty much for a f you know a month or so in Guatemala, and I took it around Lake uh, Atitlan, just a wa walking around, and there was a lot of indigenous. Um, groups there, tribes there. And I, because I had endless supply, I would, <clears throat> I would just photograph people as I met them. They didn't even recognize what the camera was, and so I, I would just take a picture. I'd take two, one for me and one for them. And I would give them that and watch their faces as they <clears throat> watched their own image develop in front of them. It was right. profound. It was <clears throat> life-changing in a way um and these and these people they cherished these objects they, that you gave them they sewed them into their clothing right I, it, it was really <clears throat> pretty fun so the the discussion here for me is um what does that change when you all of a sudden get access to as much material as you want it the thing is people younger people who might listen to this will not know this or will never have experienced that because they grew up with digital and all the pictures you want to take you can and it, it, there's no there's no actual cost there's no supply um, issue there's no supply issue it, it, you, you have as many presses on the shutter button as you like um you grew up in in the time of some level of scarcity. I grew up in a level in a, in a time where photography was analog, and every press on the shutter button meant this will cost me money. And and uh, when photography for me switched to digital, for you when Polaroid started sending you boxes of film, um, this scarcity went away, and photography became free. Did that? For you, change anything? Uh, yeah, yes, it did. Uh, generally, <clears throat> for me, there are two things that I've tried never to deny myself, and that's a book that I wanted. If mm -hmm. I wanted a book, I'd buy a book, no matter what. Even if I had to borrow money to do it, uh, books and film. So I always felt <clears throat> that, that um, I was only conscientious of how much film I had when I worked in a larger format, particularly right. eight by 10 or four by five, because A, the, just the mechanics of dealing with it were a, a, an issue and the cost of developing him um, and, and contact printing. So th there was that. Uh, with Kodachrome film, I always felt a little bit of a um, hold your breath because it wasn't something you'd want to slap onto a Nikon F3 motor drive and wail away with Kodachrome <laughs> because it was a quite an expensive little package even then to use because you had to send your film to Kodak. You know, it wasn't something you could work out at the lab or do yourself. So that was but, an issue. But in but, general, you would you would have as much film as you wanted. You'd rather not have that that burger and uh, yeah no I, I was just fortunate I or, yeah. or just lucky or pushed the envelope or didn't care but right. uh, I because it was part of my creative process it was the one thing that right. I would rather not eat at a restaurant that night or have an extra coffee or yeah. shop the, less the reason I'm asking is because we've all seen like let's say I think a good example is music you have you have this young band it's it's unknown it it is very they, they don't have a budget they don't have a contract nothing and they make their first cd their first albums in some basement in a hole um and and it's very tough and they are very limited in their resources and that first album becomes a hit 
and then they get a contract, a record contract, and um, all of a sudden they have a budget. They can throw a lot of money into it. And the second album is okay, and the third album is shit. <laughs> but you know, we've seen that is, happen, right? Yes, because yes. It's, it's a good. It's a very good analog because <clears throat> when you were in a band, I was in a band in the seventies too. And when you had recording studio time, sometimes it was like you have two hours in the studio with proper engineers and all of that stuff. Come in, make use of it. You know what I mean? You don't have right. time to write your songs here. You don't have time to do a lot of overlays. You know, you want to get down and record, you know, four tracks, eight tracks. Just get it off. Right. Do the best so, you can and out. So, so, yes. so for, for me, that switch to digital meant a lot more learning because of the immediate feedback. I think that's what you get when you, when you get a box of Polaroid film. Um, the process speeds up, I would think. Yes. It speeds um, up. And then, yeah, I think for your creativity, that didn't do much because it didn't really change the way you work. For me, it changed a lot because it was the, the, mostly, during, mostly through the learning and my creativity initially got a bit of a hit. Well, you know what's interesting is because cre creatively, I remember in the Polaroids that I was able to experiment with the very crude exposure control. So yes. you could take a picture and go like, I wonder what this would look like a third of a, straw, a stop bigger. Yeah. Now, if, if you're kind of analyzing it even now with Instax or a <clears> dollar or a sheet or whatever it is, you know, you, you don't want to just take three in a row, just little adjustments. I would do, yeah, I'd put a little nose grease on the lens and diffusion and or breathe. And, you know, so you could take a single picture six times half a pack so experimentation yes, goes up Yes, that allowed experimentation, which you I know, think a good friend of mine he had he had that he had that Polaroid experience, but in a very different way because he's not a photographer. He uh -huh. was hired when he was a student. He was hired to um, to on for some promotion for Sega, like uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. Mm -hmm. So he and another guy had to go to some shopping mall. Uh, one would dress up as a, as Sonic the Hedgehog in a costume. The other one would have a white overall. And they'd had uh, an SX-70 and boxes and boxes of Polaroid film. And what they would <laughs> do is take pictures of kids with Sonic the Hedgehog yeah. and then give them the pictures. Um, and uh, the thing was, after that job was over, he can he could keep the camera, and he had still had a couple of boxes of Polaroid left. So one day I get uh, an envelope in the mail with twenty photos in it of super mundane stuff, <laughs> as in this is my dirty laundry, this is my my sink with the dirty plates in it um, this is a fly <laughs> on the wall really interesting because from that point on for him at least for a while uh, photography wasn't something valuable anymore and it meant he changed the way he looked at things and he changed the things uh, you know, that he took pictures of you know chris it's interesting that you bring this up <clears throat> The profound, I'm going to make another analog to filmmaking. Um, th this had a profound shift, the move from analog to digital in, in cinema, because uh, up to the point that we were shooting digital, we were shooting negative. <clears throat> right. Hold on, oh, just never mind the plane. plane. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, anyway, we were shooting on film. <clears throat> and, you know, the budget allocations of film were predetermined before by, you know, the negotiation with the studio, 100,000, 200,000 feet of film, lab costs, processing costs, timing costs, negative cutting costs, all of those things right. were in. And so when you did a take... You would go, okay, we're rolling, good, action, and cut. And, and you know, I always had to be conscientious, not super conscious. It was never a, a real factor because I thought, like, well, hell, if I need more film to shoot this, I would, I would just, you know, raise it up with the, the studio, and they would like, oh, okay, well, why are you shooting so much? And it, it would be a conversation for sure. But you had to be very 
conscientious of it, <clears throat> but also the way that you would approach directing would be in terms of performance would be different. Once we went to digital, you could just let the let it roll. You could let the the take roll. You'd you'd start the take. You'd give a you'd talk during the take. You'd go okay back back up. Try that line again. Do that, and so. And then you would pile up a lot of work in post production. Exactly. Right? <laughs> I mean, like in fact, uh, I, one of, one of my directors <clears throat> in this last show, he was. I had come to visit the set, and then as soon as I stepped on the stage, and and uh, bell went off, red light flashing. Okay, take us on. That was like. 10 minutes, I'm go, you know, it's like, what the, so he, and listen, it's, it, it's fine, because the, you know, the editor is just going to whiz through it and do that, but yeah, it makes a little more work in post, but the creative energy in terms of the dynamic between a uh, director and actor really did change when you could keep a camera rolling, um, Yep. It's something that sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But I'm never thinking about the amount of, quote, footage, unquote, that I'm rolling through. Um, I think that when you're shooting with uh, the larger the format, I think the more conscious you are of, of the amount of film. Uh, just, again, I think it has more to do with process afterwards. Um, I think if you're shooting with a motor drive, a racetrack, you don't even want to think about film uh, usage. Very true. Very true. You, you, if you're shooting a portrait, you, you, you may, because everything is a little more specific. I'm talking about a formal portrait. Um, so having uh, unlimited amounts of film, and I, I will... I will make the the dreaded uh, comment that <laughs> refers to AI, <laughs> AI now. Um, I think if you are using any number of these engines with a almost paper usage or small token allotments, etc., how much you generate, how much you upscale, you're going to be, and you see it in Discord. It's like going being on. back in the days of film. It, again. It, it, it reminds me of that. Yeah. I, of course, embrace it all. I'm fortunate enough to have the privilege of going, just get me a pro subscription on get fast. Me, you, I'm going to... I generation budget, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm just going to... I'm going to generate as much and as often as I want. Um, like sometimes if I'm doing something on my phone and you get a quadrant of four, I can't really judge which one I want better on the phone. I'll just upscale them all, look at them on the computer monitor when I go to the web version, and then make my determination there. But, you know, not everybody can do that. You know, they want to really see, oh, I will upscale one, and I'm not going to zoom up, because every usage is more tokens and more money. Um, but I always, um, f for me, uh, the discipline of... Um, I guess limiting one's creative focus because of the allotment of film or digits that you have, I always felt could be a positive and could be a negative. So you really want to make sure that you make the decision of what your process is. And my process is I want to do what I got to do when I want to do it uh, and, and, and just embrace that. And if I can't afford to do that, which is, a, you know, a, a genuine thing, then I'm going to work in a different fashion. I may decide that I am going to shoot more with the mental uh, focus of a large format, even though I'm working either digitally or, or if I'm using um, a 35 millimeter. I may go, no, I'm, every shot I'm going to consider very carefully. And um, I think we've lost that uh, in terms of iPhoneography and stuff like that, where people are just hosing things down. But it's also, um, if you're going to take away from this conversation, being conscious of how much spray you are um, going to use to come up with something the old well a monkey can do it yeah you give yeah, a monkey the monkey yeah <laughs> yeah uh, eventually something's gonna happen that's interesting right um, so there's that 
And by the way, that work may be just phenomenal that that monkey created, so I'm not arguing against it. But what I'm saying is, if, um, if the allotment, if your finances are dictating how much material you can use or should use, that's okay too. Then you just have to make a creative decision mentally of your approach. And it, and it might even force you into making decisions that you wouldn't have made otherwise. Is and that I'm might saying, yeah. be a boon. It really yeah. depends, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Food for thought. Food right? for thought, yes. Food for thought. Um, let's go into the picks. Shall we? I brought us something that's not on the market yet, but it soon will be. Um, and it's called Lush Foil. It's a computer game. That is a photography simulator. So there's uh, this guy who wrote or who writes this right now. Um, I think it's Unreal Engine based and you are a photographer. I'm not really sure if there is an objective other than traveling around the world, taking pictures of things, landscapes mostly. Um, it's supposed to come out soon, coming soon. Uh, on PC, on some consoles. I'm not sure if it, it'll be on the Mac. I don't, um, yeah, possibly not. Maybe Steam? I don't know. It's on Steam, but it's, it still doesn't mean necessarily mean it's on Mac. I think it's PC only at this yeah. point. Um, but it, if, 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 you, if you always wanted to be in the Himalayas or somewhere, you could fly a drone in there as well, or in, some, or in Japan or in some interesting places that the travel budget isn't there, that might be a bit of a substitute for a while. I, think, uh, I know that they've been working on this, or he's been working on this for over a couple of years. I know this because obviously um, I did a deep dive into virtual street photography, etc. Right. And, uh, and had found that somebody was developing this. I, I had wrote some emails, I'd written some emails to people saying this would be an amazing experience for people, A, because... Um, I'm not sure uh, how much you can control the light here, but, you know, in Unreal Engine, I could go take a, a landscape and go, well, I'd like to set the sun a little bit. May maybe it's as realistic as real photography, as in you cannot control the light in landscape well, photography. Too. Yeah, you just uh, do what you got to do. But, uh, yeah, I'm for this. I, I think this would be very exciting, and I, for one, will probably use it day one so uh, oh yeah it looks it looks real fun and uh, it, like it gives you a view with a camera with the focusing points on uh and so on so it looks uh, looks as if there is quite a bit of realism in there so i'm hoping i'm hoping for it to come out soon you brought as a photographer i did just someone who who um caught my eye uh, just a fantastic eye um i'm I, i'm always um I'm always so surprised when I when I find a photographer who is shooting things that uh, I mean, you know, that, that like should be familiar, guy. but with such acute, specific compositional um, focus that uh, it, it this guy is very special. Oh, uh, that is amazing composition right there. I'm I'm a fan. Yeah, just blown away by by this person. I I, I just consistency. <laughs> you know, you think, oh, what a lucky shot to be on the street. This, right this here, right? is the exact type of photography I wish I could take all the time. Yeah, this is out of my realm. Uh, though my appreciation for this uh, knows no bounds. Um, I love it. Oh man, thank you for bringing it up. His name is Skander Kil Cliff? Cleef? Yeah, Cliff, yeah. Wow, okay, so, yeah. And I've spent a lot of time in Dakar taking pictures. Nothing as good as this. Uh, not even close. Oh well. Anyway. So, yeah, I'll, I'll sink. I'll, I'll sink into that. I'll sink my teeth Dakar? into that for sure, right after we finish recording this episode. Well, anyway, um. Photography and abundance. What a topic. And your so, pick really is leading us into another an Another episode. episode very soon. Next week. Be come back next week for another interesting <laughs> one on remote photography. 
So this was the future of photography. I'm Chris, this is Jeremiah, and we'll be back next week. You can find us online at thefutureofphotography.com. And until then, take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.